They spray our skies Interact with, with the toxic chemicals. Space travel is Hi, I'm Rich Lund, and welcome to Debunk the Funk. This is a turtle. Now, do you believe me that this is a turtle? Or do I need to prove it to you? Well, truth be told, I can't prove it to you. The best that I can do is provide you with evidence to support my claim that this is a turtle. And depending upon how skeptical you are, I either can or can't convince you with my evidence of my claim that this is a turtle. But in the end, there's nothing I can do to 100% prove that this is a turtle. This episode isn't about debunking any particular claim, but as we move forward with Debunk the Funk, there's certain details that are important that we have to address, and this is one of them. Science can't prove anything. Is it shocking to hear a science teacher say something like that? Well, honestly, it shouldn't be. If we truly understand the nature of science and how it works, well, then we also understand that science doesn't operate in proofs. Instead, Evidence is the currency of science. Still, you will find us use the words proof, prove, and proven in our everyday language incorrectly quite often, usually when we're trying to discuss evidence. Hey, I'm guilty of it myself. And I'm not saying that you won't find quotes from some of the greatest scientists misusing those words as well. They're out there. But if you wish to be a critical thinker who engages in scientific discussion and debate from time to time, then it's important to understand what these words actually mean and why they aren't really part of science. The ideas of proof, prove, and proven are really concepts of formal mathematics. When dealing with a proof in math, it relies on using axioms and established theorems as starting points. These are things that are accepted as 100% true or assumed to be 100% true. For example, a simple proof to look at would be a classic one that Two even integers, if added together, their sum will also produce an even number. Take, for example, the numbers a and b. If we say that these are even integers, then we could also write them as two times some other integer. We could call a two times x, and we could call b two times y. That would mean a plus b is also equal to two x plus two y. But that would also be equal to two times the quantity of x plus y. Since the sum of a and b can be thought of as two times the sum of x and y, that quantity must also by definition be an even integer, for it's the product of two and something else. That is a proof. It's absolute, and it's also something that's considered to be always true, that it will never be in need of revision. In science, such absolutes just simply do not exist. There are no axioms that are assumed to be 100% true from which you could even build a proof. And there is no amount of evidence you can ever show for anything that allows the concept to cross some imaginary finish line and earn the status of being 100% true forever. So how does science work if not with proofs? As I said, the currency of science is really evidence. You can start with a claim. It might be true, it might not be. To investigate the claim, you design experiments, which, if designed correctly, will be able to produce evidence that will either support or disprove the claim. So you design and you run the experiment. And let's just say, in this case, the experiment produces results that are in line with what your claim predicted should happen. Your claim, then, has been supported, but it's not proven. You might run this same experiment multiple times, making sure that you get the same results, and thus further supporting more and more your claim. You might devise a totally different experiment that also starts producing evidence that is also in line with what your claim suggested should happen, supporting it in a totally different way. Also, multiple other scientists might run similar experiments, making sure that they're getting the same results that you're getting. They might devise their own experiments to also test out your claim. And if every time the results are in line with what your claim, your hypothesis is suggesting should happen, it's getting stronger and stronger support. Still, no matter how much evidence or support that you can give to an idea, a claim, a theory, they never reach that status of being considered 100% percent 
absolutely true. This might actually bother many of you out there, especially if this is the first time that you've ever had to confront the idea that science doesn't have the power to prove something 100% true. But this is actually one of the key points that gives science the immense power that it has. Unlike so many other schools of thought that try to understand the universe around us, science has this as a strong advantage. It's willing to revise. No idea, no matter how seemingly strong and valid it is, is immune to questioning. Thus, as ideas are continuously questioned, re-examined, tested out with previously unthought experiments, if they continue to get support from the results of these experiments, those ideas only become stronger and stronger. We continue to build more and more confidence that these ideas are correct, getting closer and closer, but never reaching 100% true. But this also means that the ideas in science, they are able to be revised. If after doing many experiments that are in line with the idea that have supported it, some new experiment comes along and produces new evidence that is actually contrary to what the idea claimed should happen, well then that idea can be edited to take in the new evidence. We never want to say that some idea is 100% absolutely true. Many times in history, there's examples where new evidence has emerged that was contrary to what we thought should be. And we've had to tweak our ideas and our theories, so that way they are in line with all of the evidence. But for a very well-established, well-supported theory to be removed and replaced with a new theory, well, that new theory has to match all of the previous evidence. It has to match it equally as well as the previous theory and it must also fit with the new evidence that's emerged. Quite often, when surprising evidence comes along, it's not that the theory we had is junk and needs to be replaced, but instead that the theory we had just wasn't all the way there at explaining everything, and sometimes just minor revisions and minor edits need to be made in order to account for the new evidence. And that leads us to our next point. If science can't prove anything, well, can it disprove anything? Well, this area actually has some debate. Somebody could say, well, if you claim to have disproven something, well, doesn't that just mean that you proved that it's not true? And thus, wouldn't that just contradict the first idea that science can't prove anything? Okay, you got me. But really, that's only because of the word choice that we're using there in semantics. For example, I can make the following claim. If I walk down a flight of stairs, I will reach the bottom and not be injured. Now I can test out this idea hundreds and thousands of times. Each time that I walk down the flight of stairs and I reach the bottom uninjured, I've supported the claim. But it only takes one time for me to be walking down the stairs and sprain my ankle for most to agree that the claim, as stated, is disproven. Yet still, there will be some who may wish to debate this. One could argue that the sprain that occurred was independent of me walking down the stairs at all. That there was some sort of internal hiccup going on inside of my ankle that caused it. And that if I had just been walking down the street at the time, the same sprain would have occurred. And technically, though it would be a very small one, they would have a window of argument there. But in such situations, a critical thinker needs to make a decision. Science cannot prove or disprove anything 100%. But have you seen enough evidence to decide if some claim has been proven or disproven enough for you to accept or reject it? And that brings me back to my turtle or at least what I claim to be a turtle. For some of you, just showing you my turtle would be enough evidence to support my claim and convince you that this is a turtle. She has dry, scaly skin. No noticeable hair is growing off of her. She doesn't seem to produce her own body heat. And of course, there's the shell, which many would agree is a dead giveaway. But now, imagine, if you will, that there exists a hypothetical group of people who proudly label themselves as turtle deniers. They feel that there is no such thing as turtles. According to them, turtles do not exist. From their perspective, it just so happens that some lizard species have evolved a mutation that allows them to have shells. Well, hold on there, you might say. The shell isn't the only key piece of evidence at your disposal. Most lizards have teeth, and this animal, clearly a reptile, does not. But the turtle deniers, they've heard this before, and they're ready for this. They let you know that the same lizards that happen to have evolved shells, they also evolve to not need teeth any longer. Okay, so you take your turtle to a vet and have it actually examined and certified as being a turtle. But the turtle deniers, they counter this by saying that your vet, well, they just unquestioningly believed what they were taught at the university. 
and that they were inoculated into the same lies as others. Maybe you even go to such lengths as sending in a nail clipping from your turtle and have its DNA tested. Though it was costly, when the results come back, it shows that the DNA has all of the relevant markers that signify that it is indeed a turtle. But the turtle deniers, they, they scoff at this as well. They say that your turtle was only identified as a turtle because its DNA was compared to other quote-unquote turtles, which are really just shelled lizards, and that actually you just proved their point for them. You might at that point start to realize that there really will be no convincing a turtle denier that this is a turtle. They already have their conclusion, and they're going to stick with it, regardless of what evidence you bring to the table. So why bring up all of this? What's the point? Why did I feel that this was a topic that was important to have in one of the early Debunk the Funk episodes? Well, two reasons. Number one, we should have an understanding of how science works as we attempt to investigate claims. And it's important then that we also speak the same language. We must understand that it's never about 100% proving or 100% disproving anything. Only that has enough evidence been presented so that someone rational would either accept or reject the idea that we're discussing. And to be aware that the irrational are out there, the equivalent of turtle deniers, will always be out there. Anytime an idea, a claim, a theory has been overwhelmingly supported and we know it with 99.999% certainty, well, there will always be that territory, that thousandth of a percent for the turtle deniers to set up camp. The second reason, number two, is that way this might equip you. That way if you do choose to engage in some type of scientific debate with somebody, you'll be able to easily detect in some cases whether or not the person truly understands how science works. If the person starts demanding proof or pointing out that science has had centuries to prove something and still hasn't, well, that kind of person is pretty much waving the flag that they don't really understand how science operates. Lack of proof, they feel, is a weakness when really it's not even actually part of science. And equally, if you encounter someone who is claiming that they have proofs of their pseudoscientific garbage, well, then you already know that there's a flag on the play, and you should proceed with skeptical caution. I'm Rich Lund. Thanks for watching. And remember, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure you're one of them. And by the way, this is a turtle. See you next time.